Well, good morning, Forefront. How's everybody doing? Good you guys hopefully staying warm. Thank you guys for braving the cold and the snow today. I'm so glad you're here with us. Uh, for the rest of our church family that uh, couldn't make it out, got stuck in your driveway at home, or couldn't find your uh, extra winter layers, thank you, for, thank you guys for watching at home on our live stream. So excited that you're able to join us today. Well, guys, it's good to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to grab those and turn with me to the book of Proverbs. If your family is anything like ours, about once a year, you realize it's time for the new family picture. And uh, for usually, for us, it usually hits in the fall time. We realize here pretty soon we're going to have to send out Christmas cards, and it's coming quick. So let's go ahead and get our, our family <laughs> photo together. And hopefully for all of you, it's as easy as it is for us. You know, you just pick the place you want to go, show up somewhere beautiful, pile out of the car, one picture, and boom, it's time for lunch. Right? Actually, it's the exact opposite. Picture day is probably one of the hardest days of the year. I don't know, anybody agree with me out there? It's a, it's a really challenging day. There, there are normally tears involved, uh, lots of whining about the outfits that mom picked out. You know, you can't find that second shoe of the pair of shoes you really want to wear. You're, you're murmuring about the hair bow, and, and that's just me. That's just me. Not to mention all of the things the girls have to do to try to get ready. And then you get out to the place where you want to take the picture and it's either 100 degrees outside or it's negative three with, with a wind chill. And I guess at least when it's that cold, the wind kind of dries the tears, kind of freezes the tears, right? It makes it a little easier. One of the kid, all, kids always falls and scrapes their knee. That, that always happens. But in, after an hour or so and two memory cards and about 300 pictures, you go home hoping that you have the perfect family picture. You go home hoping that you have the one that you can put on Facebook, because that's where it really needs to go, and hang on a canvas on your wall. But here's the thing. When you get home and you start looking through all of those photos, and all of a sudden, you find the one. Something changes, doesn't it? When you find the one, all of a sudden, you realize that all of the tears and all of the scraped knees and all of the pain was totally worth it, because you have that perfect picture to send out in your Christmas card and to hang on the wall of your living room. You know, as you think about family, as we think about the family picture, wouldn't it be great if that's how we got families? Wouldn't it be great if we would just go out one day's worth of work, blood, sweat, and tears, we could come home with a good-looking picture that turned out to be a good-looking family, right? We came home, and family all came together. That would just be amazing. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing with just one day's worth of work, all of a sudden your kids started to behave in public? Then all of a sudden, as a parent, you had the right things to say, those sticky sayings that you needed in those difficult moments. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? But I think in reality, we all recognize this isn't how families come together. This isn't how we develop a good family. We can look good in a picture as a family, but be a mess on the other side. See, I think the reason is that the pictures are external, right? The family, there's an internal element. There's, there's something more to it than that. These past few weeks, we've been talking about how we can be wise in our major areas of life. We've been talking about how we can use godly wisdom to impact areas like decision making. To use godly wisdom to impact the way we use our words. And Last week, we talked about how we can use godly wisdom when it comes to our families. I think one of the realities for all of us in our lives, no matter what stage of life you're in, we all have this desire in our hearts to be part of family, to be, to be part of a family, to be part of a family that has life-giving relationships. Yet, as we talked a little bit about last week, family is, is difficult. Family is tough. Family is hard. Family gets messy. It's much easier to break than it is to build. So the question that we pondered last week and I want us to consider today is how can we be wise when it comes to family? How can we use the wisdom of God when it comes to our families? As we look at God's word, and we talked about this last week, we, we see that God has given us a design for family. As we look all over the Bible, all over God's word, at the way he created us, the way he designed families to work together, he designed our families to reflect his role as a heavenly father to us. But the problem is that we've allowed sin to sneak in. Sin has led to brokenness. And this brokenness of sin is probably seen clearly in the fracture of our relationships in our families. 
So if we see that God has a design for us, the question we have to consider as Christians is how do we recapture this design? The last few weeks, we've really been looking at the book of Proverbs. And seeing that the book of Proverbs gives us wisdom for life. It, it gives us God's, it really gives us a snapshot of how we can live in a way that honors God and how that reflects its way into our lives. And, and as we look at the book of Proverbs, one of the biggest pictures we see over and over through this book is this, this picture, this image of the parent and the child. The dynamic of, of father-son, of, of mother-daughter. And what we see over and over again is this call to parents to teach their kids the ways of God. And we see the similar call to the kid, to the child, to listen, to receive the word of their parents. And as this picture begins to come into focus for us, what we see is a family that is centered on God and his word. And so here's what I want us to see today, church. Here's our big idea, if you, if you take a notice at home. If we're going to recapture God's design for family, then Jesus must be at the center of our relationships. Jesus must be our foundation if we're going to recapture God's design for our lives. Because recapturing God's design for family, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes patience. But here is the good news, church. It's possible. The good news is God's design for family can be grasped. It can be recaptured in your lives and in mine. And so that's why it's so important that we understand how to grow in wisdom in our families. So this morning I want us to see a few ways that we can grow in wisdom. So if you have your Bibles open, flip with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9 together. Chapter 1, Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. Solomon writes in verse 8, Hear my son your father's instruction. And forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. It's time for us to join together to open your word together. Lord, I pray for our church family that couldn't make it in today because of the cold weather and the snow. I pray that everybody is home safely wrapped up in a and comfortable, comfortable blanket or, or jammy still with a hot cup of coffee and the live stream on. And I just pray, Lord, that um, you just uh, keep everybody safe as we come and we go uh, to, uh, to church together this morning. Father, we, we've been just digging into this, uh, this topic of finding your wisdom. And I pray that today as we spend time talking about family, relationships that can be messy and that can be hard and can be difficult, that you help us to see that you have a plan for us. That you want to redeem our families. And that we can do so by centering ourselves on you. By centering our relationships on your son, Jesus Christ. And by focusing our eyes to the source of wisdom itself. Father, I pray today that you just open our hearts and help us to see how we can live in light of your truth. Lord, be with those here today that are just battling different health challenges, that are battling sickness and colds and the stomach bug, uh, the, the flu that's been going around. I just pray for our church to help nurse us back to health, Lord, and help us walk alongside one another and care for one another uh, during this season. Father, guide us today and direct us in your word. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So a study was done in Britain a while back. And the study in Britain was aimed at identifying how much time do we as families actually spend together. If you think about it, you know, think about the amount of time if you guys are parents or if you're teens and kids here today. How much time do you spend with your parents in a given day? I mean, you get up in the morning, right? You get your clothes on, brush your teeth, get ready for school, taking them to school, picking them up from school, or spending the evening at home before bedtime. What is that, five, six hours maybe that you're together as a family? So the study in Britain determined something that was pretty shocking. The study found that the average family in the UK only spends about 34 minutes of undistracted time together. You're together five or six hours, but out of that time, you actually spend about 34 minutes together. And I'd say in America, we're probably as distracted, if not more. So here's the challenge. How do we change that? How do we change that number? I mean, it's pretty shocking. I think we all would agree. But if you think about it, how easy is it to fall into that rhythm? I mean, the TV on in the background, our phones chirping in our pockets, all of the different events our kids have to go to, I think it gets, becomes really easy for us to get distracted. 
And that time we spend, maybe it's just at the dinner table. And after that, we go and do our own thing. So I think as parents, especially living today in this world of distraction, it, it's, it's important now as ever that we have the wisdom for how we can be engaged in our families. That we can be wise in how we grow our relationships with our family members. And it's funny that 3,000 years ago, God gave us a book about how to raise kids in a distracted culture. It shows that God's word is always relevant. Amen, church? Amen. God's word is always relevant. So here's a here's our, here's our question we're going to ask. How do we as parents become wise when it comes to raising our kids? How do we buck that trend? How do we make that 34 minutes, two hours or more? What do we do? How do we change this? As we look at the book of Proverbs, we see this really awesome thing that runs the entire book. And we saw it there in, in chapter 1, verse 8. This, this picture that we're seeing of parents instructing and teaching their kids. Proverbs 1, 8 says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your father's teaching. Proverbs 2, 1 says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Proverbs 3, 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandment. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Proverbs 4, 1, Hear, O son, the father's instruction, and be intended that you may gain insight, notice this theme. There's this call for the parent to their child, a call for the parent to instruct, a call for the child to listen, and there is a promise embedded in this. That, that this promise is that when, when we give instruction and teaching, and when it is received, wisdom is found. Wisdom is ours. But, but what we have to see from the parent's perspective first is parenting, instructing, Teaching isn't just us as mom and dad shouting out commands. What we see is that the parents are engaged in the process of teaching, instructing, and training. So this is our first way that we're going to grow in wisdom as a family. We grow in wisdom as parents by engaging with our children. And I think this makes sense to us. We grow in wisdom as parents by engaging with our, with our kids. Back when I was playing football, our, our coach would teach us the importance of blocking. And any of you guys that played ball, I, I, you guys probably hated blocking as much as I did. It was not fun. But you needed to engage the defender if the play was going to be successful. A successful block on a defender wasn't just setting a pick like you would in basketball. It was engaging that individual at the line of scrimmage to hold them up so the running back could get by or the wide receiver could break a run. And, and this is parenting. Church, this is parenting. We're engaging our kids in the trenches like an offensive lineman in the defensive line. Right? They're a little smaller, but we're still engaging them, holding them up. We're meeting them where they are. Because when we engage with our children, it means that we are actively involved with them. I, many of us can probably think back to when we grew up, we had maybe a mentor or a teacher or a coach who really took interest in our lives, really engaged with us. Maybe for you, it was a mu music instructor who said, hey, I see how you're playing those notes, but let me give you a tip. Let me show you how to make the transition uh, to another chord much smoother. Or it was a, a teacher who said, hey, you have a great start on this rough draft. You've got great potential, but here's a few ways to improve your writing. Here's a few ways to improve your paper. In the book of Proverbs, what we see here is it's not a coach or a teacher that is instructing, but it's the parents. It, it's the mom and the dads that are leaning in. And I think as, as we look around the room, as we think about this like dynamic right between mom and dad, as moms, this teaching comes a little more natural. I, I think as moms, you have this mommy DNA that kicks in when it comes to teaching your kids. And you can lean in and you can engage a little easier. But for dads, it's a little more difficult for us. As dads, we like to tell our kids how it should be, don't we? As dads, we like to teach, but we, like to, we prefer it to be more of a speech. We'd prefer to kind of tell you how you do it. You need to kind of figure it out on your own. But here's how you need to live to be successful. And I think it's much easier for us to give a speech, but then be a little more hands-off. But if we look at God's Word, we don't see that. We see that Dad and Mom are both engaged. They're both leaning in. Proverbs 1.8 says, Hear your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Church, how are our kids going to hear the wisdom of God? If we're not speaking, we've got to be engaged. We've got to be speaking. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who withholds the rod hates 
his son. I mean, that's pretty, pretty harsh. Proverbs goes on to say, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. If we are to discipline our kids in the love of God, then we have to be involved in their lives. So what does this look like? What does this look like? God calls us to be engaged. How do we do it? Proverbs 22, 6, classic verse, we've all heard it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's a classic verse and a great principle for life, right? Well, think about this word, train up. What, what comes to mind when you hear the word train up? This word is actually better translated as dedicate. So think about what we dedicate in our lives, things we dedicate our lives to. In our culture, we dedicate our lives to all sorts of things. We dedicate our lives to our careers. I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, you go to med school, you spend 8 to 12 years in school before you'll ever become a doctor, before you ever really start practicing medicine on your own. We dedicate ourselves to learning instruments. We start playing the piano when we're six, and we quit, and we start again, and we quit, and we start again, and we play until we're old enough to finally put it together, and then it's great. We dedicate our, maybe a day a week for date night or something like that with our spouse. Proverbs 22, 6 is telling us as parents to dedicate our child in the ways of God. To dedicate our child in the ways of God that we are to engage with our kids for the purpose of teaching them what it looks like to live in a way that honors God. Because when we dedicate our kids, we're setting them on the right path. We're training them up, but we're making a commitment to do so. That's why here at Forefront, we believe in child and family dedication. That, that when you have a baby, we want to dedicate that baby in the public eye of the church and in front of God as a way to say, we as parents are going to raise this kid in a way that honors the Lord. So we, we see this idea of dedication, but how do we do it? Right? How, how do we put this in place? So, so let me say I was going to take a quick survey around the room. And I was going to ask you, what is your main purpose as a parent? What would you say? How, how would you answer that question? What is your main purpose as a parent? I think some of us may, might say, well, it's to get them ready for life. It's to uh, raise them in a way where they, they have help understand the world around them, to help them get into a good school, to find a great career where they can find fulfillment and raise their own family, to, to teach them how to make good decisions. And those are all really good answers. But what if I told you there was an answer that encompassed all of those together. What, what do you think it would be? What would that answer be? See, what we see here in the book of Proverbs is that God is telling us that as parents, we are to raise our kids to know God, to know the Lord. And when we grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God, it opens the doors for us to learn the lessons about life. Amen, church? All of those things, becoming ready for life, understanding relationships, making good decisions, being prepared for relationships and careers, all of it funnels from the concept of knowing God, learning what he has for us, and how to walk in light of his truth. And so as parents, this is what God has called us to do. I like what Ray Ortland says. Ray Ortland says that our role as parents is not to get our kids ready for the American dream, but our role is to raise them for Christ. It's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge. I think... We like the American dream. It tugs at our heartstrings. But we need to get them ready to be ready to live for Christ. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of how we put it into action. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses gives us a really good insight into this. If you guys have been following along in our Read Scripture plan, uh, a few, uh, I think it was last week, we were in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And what you find in this situation is Moses is standing in front of the nation of Israel, and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is telling them, hey guys, listen up. You're getting ready to go into a place that's going to distract you, that's going to try to steal your heart, that's going to try to steal your attention from God. So what we need to do is be ready to train up our kids and their kids and their kids. So future generations do not forget the greatness of God. And this is what Moses tells the nation of Israel Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you shall today shall be on your heart. He says in verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your home, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as 
frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Notice what, notice what God is saying to you. He's, he's right here showing us how to put this into action. He shows us how to engage and how to raise up our kids. And we do this in, in everyday life, in everyday conversations, by pointing them to the amazing things that God has done. See, church, we don't have to take our kids to a conference to train them up, to show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. We talk to them when we're at home. We talk to our kids in the car on the way to school or on the way to church. We ask them what they learned at church on the way home. We talk to them and pray with them before they go to bed. There's no magic formula here. It's just being engaged in the lives of our kids. Chuck Swindoll says that each day of our lives we make deposits in the memory banks of our children. So the challenge to us as parents is, what are we depositing today? What am I going to deposit tonight? What am I depositing tomorrow? God is saying is that we keep the things of God in front of our kids and in front of ourselves. We're not going to forget them. We're going to be intentional to engage. Last summer, I had the privilege of coaching uh, my girls' baseball teams. So Emma and Hallie, they played this kind of a hybrid t-ball coach-pitch league, right? And if you guys have ever coached, you guys know that some of the most challenging ages to coach are four, five, and six, right? Because when you're five and six, these kids don't know the game yet. You know, you look, you, you look at these kids, you're teaching them the elements. This is first base, this is second base, this is how we run the bases. Here's how we uh, catch the ball, here's how we throw. I mean, just the basic fundamentals at that age. But as a coach, it's so important because we're there to instruct and correct. It, it's, it's the combo of instruction and correction. And this is really the life of a parent, isn't it? To stand next to our kids and to coach them. To get them ready for the game of life. And God's word tells us that the best training starts on the foundation of God. Teaching them the truth about who they are. What their identity is. That they are created in the image of God. And they're created to walk in the truth that God has set before them. As I look around this room, I see a lot of parents. And I know in our church we have a, a lot of parents of young kids like mine. Others, your kids are teens. Some of you, your kids are grown. Some of you don't have kids yet. But no matter where you are or how, older, how old your children are, there's a truth that we all have to consider. There's a truth we all have to realize that the time we have with our kids is not long enough. I think every parent of growing kids or kids that are grown up can nod along with that one. The time we have with our kids is not nearly long enough. I had a wise parent once tell me, while the days are long, and they are when you have an 18 month old, 18 month old at home, while the days are long, the years are short. The years are short. And I think for us as parents, sometimes we don't recognize this truth until, until later, until our kids are grown, or until our kids are growing up and we look back and say, wow, man, my kid's gonna start senior year in high school next year. Where did the time go? So this is the truth that I think we all need to realize because we don't know how God wants to use our kids. We don't know how God wants to use us as parents to raise our kids. I mean, just think about, as we look over the course of the Bible, how God has used young men and women. I mean, God called Samuel into ministry when he was just a boy. David was anointed as king as a young man. In 2 Kings, Josiah was named king at eight years old. If you guys have any kids that are eight, you know, that's a scary age to be a king. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon was just 16 when he pastored his first church. 16. I wasn't, I wasn't even driving on the right side of the lane at 16. The truth is, God wants us to get our kids ready. And he has an amazing plan for your son and your daughter. And he wants to use you because he specifically placed you in the life of that little one. So if we're going to train up our kids for life, church, we have to be engaged in their lives. We have to lean in. We have to be committed to get them ready. But God doesn't limit his discussion on family to just parents. Notice, he also speaks to kids. And no matter how old you are, you're still a kid. You have a mom and a dad. And so God is speaking to us as well. So we, we grow in wisdom as parents by engaging with our children. And secondly, we grow in wisdom with our parents by receiving their words. But we grow in wisdom with our parents by receiving their words. If you look back at Proverbs 1, 8 and 9 again. Notice it said, Hear, my, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Notice, 
There is a responsibility on the child of the hearer. Not only is the parent to be engaged with their kids, the hearer, the child, no matter how old you are, is to perceive those words. Why? Because when they receive that wisdom, it becomes a graceful wreath on our head and an ornament around our neck, meaning that that wisdom is seen in the way we live our lives. We receive the blessings of living a life that honors God because we have taken the wisdom of God's word that were given to us by our parents. Our lives will demonstrate the blessing of a life that is wise. It's a beautiful promise, isn't it? I mean, it's a beautiful promise of the given and the take of parent and child, yet it's a very difficult task to capture. You might ask, well, why, why is that so difficult? Why is that so hard? Well, if you've been a kid, you, you understand why it's so hard. Because we typically aren't very good listeners when we're young. Now, some of you guys in your teens, you guys may be great listeners. But I wasn't very good when I was, when I was your age. See, as kids, we have better things to do than listen, don't we? We've got games to play. We've got buddies to hang out with. You know? The, the Nuggets are going to play tonight, right? I've got to pay attention to these things. And as we grow up, we go, from the, we go from the things we need to do to the fact that we think we know better, don't we? Especially when we're teens, man. We think we know better than our parents. Dad, you are just old-fashioned. You just don't understand the way the world works anymore. And it's funny, but it's, it's often through mistakes that we make, through bad decisions and life experiences that we look back on those and we think, you know what? My dad had it right. My mom had it right. I can't tell you how many times I look back on things my parents taught me, and at that time I didn't want to hear it, or I thought I knew better. But I look back and I think my dad exact, knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew exactly what he was saying. So, as kids, as children, whether your kids are 2, 22, whether you're 42 or 82, it doesn't matter we still have this responsibility to take the wisdom that our parents are teaching us and to receive it. So, so how do we grow in this? How do we actually receive the wisdom that our parents have to give us? How, how do we actually avoid the heartburn that comes from learning after the fact? Some of it's life, right? Some of it just, that's the way the world works. Our parents tell us things, we make a bad decision, we see that our parents are right, and we change our action next time. But I'm convinced that some of the indigestion that we get from making bad decisions comes from our own failure to listen. It comes from our own arrogance and our own pride. So, church, if we can just become better listeners, we can avoid a lot of the heartburn. We can save a lot of money on tongues down the road. Solomon tells us in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Solomon says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my command with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Notice that picture. It's like a wide receiver catching a pass from a quarterback. The father calls his son to receive his words, to incline his heart to understanding. That's something we have to do. We don't naturally incline our hearts to our parents' teaching. We have to force ourselves into search for knowledge. Proverbs 15, 20 says that a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. So what makes for a son or a daughter that is wise? Proverbs 2 says it's that we receive the words of our parents. And that's by being good listeners. Exodus 20, 12, one of the Ten Commandments God has given us is to what? Honor who? Your father and your mother. How we honor our parents? We honor them by showing them respect. And one of the ways we respect them is by receiving their words, by taking it to heart. Unfortunately, I think we live in a culture today, if you turn on your TV, watch a movie, watch any of your sitcoms on major networks, you're going to see that the world has painted a very sad and negative picture of the parents. Every TV show, every movie, they love to show the picture of the dad who's some out-of-touch dad who's not really plugged in, as some mom who's over-the-top, maybe even a bit ridiculous. And so our kids see this as they watch TV, and they think, man, that must be how my parents are going to be. That must be what real life is like. But church, we have to battle that in our culture. We have to stand in front of that. And, and, and this, this picture of family misses the mark on so many levels. We have to be intentional to know that culture is wrong. To teach our kids that God's word has a perfect picture for parents and child and how we can work together. 
So listening to our parents is one of the ways that we show them honor and respect. Now, li listening obviously doesn't mean that we, we do everything they say, but when we listen, we take it into account. We weigh it into our decisions. And chances are, if you're like me, you look back and say, yeah, my mom and dad were right again, again. You know, when I think of this dynamic between mom and dad and, and son and daughter, I, I think of, you know, I'm on my sport references right now because baseball season's coming. I think of a catcher. You know, think of, think of a major league catcher. You know, if you watch a good catcher, they're going to receive the pitch from the pitcher, no matter where it is. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a strike across the plate. If it's in the dirt, they're going to snag it. They're going to lean from one side to another to receive that pitch. And, and sometimes, when it is in the dirt, they're going to fall off balance, but they're still going to do their best to catch it. But they show honor to the pitcher by making sure they catch the ball. It would be pretty disrespectful if the catcher just knocked the ball off to the side, wouldn't it, of the pitcher? Like, like a pitcher, our parents sometimes are going to throw us pitches in the dirt. They're not going to all be strikes across the middle. Sometimes they're going to be balls on the outside. But as children, as kids, we're respectful to receive the, the wisdom that our parents give us. And we honor it by taking it in and considering it. By catching the ball and receiving their words. So church, we, we, we don't only grow in wisdom as parents by engaging with our children. But we also grow in wisdom with our parents by receiving their words. Third, I want you to see third here. We grow in wisdom as families when we point one another to Jesus. That, that we, we grow in wisdom as families when we come together and we point one another to Jesus. As, as we've seen here in Proverbs 1, it's this beautiful promise. This beautiful promise that if we as parents are engaged with our kids, and if we as children are receiving the words of our, pay, of our parents, then wisdom will be seen in the way that we live. But I don't want us to miss the verse that comes immediately before this. If you've got your Bibles open, look with me. Proverbs 1. The verse that comes right before this is Proverbs 1.7. And Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of knowledge. If we're going to impart wisdom and knowledge to our kids, in church, we have to be wise ourselves. We have to be wise ourselves. We have to go to the source of wisdom itself. You know, I've had a lot of discussion with parents over the years, and they'll say things like, you know, I really need to get my kids into church. I really need to get back into church so I can start taking my kids, so they can start learning about God, so they can hear all the things that I learned when I was a kid. And it's a good, I mean, it's a good attitude, it's a good focus. I mean, the parents obviously see that it's good for their kids to learn the ways of God, but I think those parents are missing the most important part. That in order for their kids to learn about God, they need to be the ones that model it for them. I mean, have you ever been on an airplane and you get ready to take off and the flight, you know, the, the uh, stewardess comes on or, or uh, one of the, the people on the plane comes on and they say, okay, guys, we're going to give you instructions. Here's how you can latch your seatbelt. And if the cabin loses air pressure and the masks fall down, make sure to put your mask on before you put your mask on the person next to you. Why do you think that is? Why do I put my mask on before I put it on my kid? Because if I pass out because I can't breathe, I'm not going to get it on my kid, right? And the same goes for teaching them the ways of God. If I'm going to teach my kids the way of God, who Jesus is, then I need to be putting my mask on first. I need to be growing in my relationship with Jesus first. As a church, we love having your kids. As a church, we love the privilege of training your kids up in the way of God. It, it's a privilege. It's a blessing. It's what we exist for. But we have to see, church, if you guys are parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or one day hope to be what we teach your kids on Sunday for the one or two or three hours they're here, it's got to be supplemental to what you're teaching them at home. It has to be, church. That's the way that God has designed it to be. So as parents... We need to be the one. We need to be the ones modeling it at home first. Billy Sunday says that to train a boy in the way he should go, you must go that way yourself. To train a boy in the way he should go, you must go that way yourself. So let's ask the tough question: How are we doing in that? If you're a mom or a dad, an aunt or an uncle, grandma and a grandpa, how are we doing in modeling that for our kids? Do they see that in us? If we're going to grow 
in wisdom with our families, church. We need to be personally growing in wisdom ourselves. That means we need to personally be seeking the source of wisdom itself, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Amen. Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. When your kids see you seeking after God, your kids are going to take notice, and they're going to find their hope in the one who gave his life for them. So, where do, we, where do we go from here? Where, where, where do we start? I, I think in our hearts, we hear that as parents, and we say, yes, I want to point my kids to Jesus, but how do I do it? How do I do it? You know, I'm not very good at memorizing Bible verses, right? I just don't know if I can answer those tough questions. Well, I want us to see that it starts pretty simple. Three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts, three quick takeaways, taking notes. First, we commit to engaging with our kids. Commit to engaging with our kids. Proverbs 16, 9 says that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And, and we need to see his parents. God has put you where he wants you. God has put you in the lives of the kid, of, of your children, for a purpose. That he is going to give you everything you need to raise your kids, to train up your kids in the way they should go. But we just have to make the commitment to engage. Amen, church? We just have to take a step out and say, you know what? It's going to be messy, and I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to feel like the conversations I'm having aren't going anywhere, but I'm going to stay in the game. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to commit to staying engaged. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to take in as many resources as I can, but I'm going to commit to staying in for the long haul because I know God's going to work through me. Secondly, start small and keep it simple. You don't have to buy a Bible study to walk your kid through. <laughs> you don't have to take your kid to a conference. You don't have to do these exorbitant things. Just talk to your kid about what you're reading in the Bible. As you're reading through our Read Scripture plan, just talk to them. What do you, ask them, what do you think about that? It sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? What do you think God's saying there? Just start conversations. Keep it simple. Remember that that conversation you're having is planting seeds for future conversations. It's not about getting the whole gospel and the whole counsel of God in in one discussion. Plant a seed for the future, for a lifelong discussion with your kids. Third, be intentional to create space for discussion. So think about it. I'm committing, I'm keeping it simple, and then I'm just being intentional. I'm creating space for discussion, and that means we're setting aside time to connect. One thing I like to do with my girls is about once a month, I like to do daddy-daughter date night. Daddy-daughter date night's fun. I look forward to it. They look forward to it. They know they're going to get ice cream out of the deal. So it's good for both of us, right? But we go out, and it just creates space. You know, we may not talk about anything too crazy, but it's creating an opportunity for discussion. And in those moments, we're just connecting. I'm engaged. They're hearing what I have to say. And we're just enjoying this picture that God has set for us for family. So we, we uh, commit, start small, and then we're just intentional to create space. Simple steps. But what I want us to see, church, is we take those steps. God will work through. He'll create opportunities for him to move in the lives of our family. Church, again, as we close, if we're going to recapture God's design for family, Jesus must be at the center of our relationships. When I was a kid, we used to love to play dominoes. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys grew up playing dominoes. But we wouldn't like to, we, we, we would get bored with a traditional domino game. We'd start to set up the dominoes in a row, right? Set them up across the table, over the bookshelf, across the couch. And then what do you do? Knock the first one over. Domino effect, right? Chain reaction. It was, it was a blast. Typically when we think about the domino effect, though, we, we usually think of it in a negative way, don't we? We think of the domino effect as something bad happens and then a series of bad things happen. When it comes to family, I think... We can often see this happen. One bad decision, one harsh word can lead to a domino effect of hurts and pain. Broken families and strained relationships between mother and daughter, father and son can occur, and then sometimes we just throw up our hands and we just give up. But what I want us to see, church, is that the domino effect can also be a chain reaction for good. Because can you imagine how we as a church could impact our culture if we as parents leaned in? If we change that trend? If we turned off the distractions, if we committed to make that 34 minutes of undistracted family time a day two hours, how could that chain reaction change your family? How could a changed family change your neighborhood and this church? It could be incredible. So my friends, each of us walked in here today in different family situations. 
Some of us are in the middle of a tough season with our faith. Some of us are in the middle of heartbreak and pain. Some of us are coming out of one, a season or going into one. And I think we all recognize family is tough. But I want us to see that no matter what has happened in the past, no matter how strained a relationship seems, that healing and repair are possible. That healing and repair can happen. And all this change for good can be found as we look to Jesus as our example. Because in the person of Jesus, we see, uh, we see someone that received the words of his heavenly father and communicated and instructed his family, his followers, and pointed everybody came across to the kingdom of God. Church, I want us to see that as we center our lives on Jesus, as we see that God loves us so much and he wants our family to be healed, he wants our family to be whole, he wants to redeem our relationships, we, as we pursue wisdom in Jesus, we will see that wisdom play out in our lives and in our families. And we can lean in and see God do amazing things. God wants to redeem our relationships. But to do so, we need to center that relationship on Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. I pray this week that we can take these steps forward, that as parents we can engage, as children we can listen, and as families we can show Jesus to one another. And when we do, when we make God the center of our home, when we make Jesus the foundation of our relationships, we are walking in the wisdom for life, and we will find wisdom for my family. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray.